you start here? Uh, what brought you here? Because this is not the first time you've been, uh, you are here in Prague. So, um, I can't remember the first time, but it seems to have become an annual invitation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think at least four or maybe five times I've been here. Okay. Um, once to do a solo in this very room, play. Uh, another time was to work with a trio um, in the music festival mm -hmm. that was either last year or the year before. Um, and also I was invited to make a quintet piece which included two great musicians and a selection of uh, excellent dancers from here. Mm -hmm. uh, here being not just the Czech Republic but also Slovakia, Slovenia. Um, and that also was, if it wasn't last year, it was just the year before. Okay. And here I am back again. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, how is it different or why did you accept the invitation uh, now, this year? Is there anything different or uh, with what maybe expectations do you come? This why year? do I accept an invitation? I usually accept an invitation because they can write a good mail. Okay. And because there's something that I feel when somebody writes a good mail that is, genu is a genuine interest. The interest is direct from them to the work mm -hmm. and they feel that something I might bring has not only relevance to the space, to the local community, to the dance community, to the, the local public who might watch, but also I rate it on whether there is, I feel, a space where my work can resound and be received. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a mutual interest um, at working from both sides and uh, I've always found that people have organized here and arranged for things to happen. It's just top quality. Mm -hmm. It's just as simple as that. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a pleasure to do the, the business side of things. And that very often is an artistic indication. Because if, that's, if that side of things is complicated, very often the artistic mind and the atmosphere artistically is also complicated. And here I feel the, the people in, in charge are creative and they, uh, they take risk, they have interest. And those, the, that combination is very attractive to me. I feel welcomed okay. and uh, supported, which of course any artist is hungry for. Mm -hmm. Okay, and can you tell us a little bit more about the performance part of your stay yes. this year? And then we'll later we go for the workshop as well. Okay. Um, so what can we see if the public looks for the program and see? They'll so see a piece they... called Interview. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which is funny, yeah. <laughs> and it's all in capitals, which is different from an interview. Um, in, in capital I and small letters. Uh, the piece itself is called Interview uh, because it's an interview. Mm -hmm. I'm quite a simple artist on some levels. I like the title to be full of imagination, but also it uh, doesn't need to be cryptic mm -hmm. or confusing. Having said that, there is only one of us, and I am both the interviewer and the interviewed and I interview numerous different people. Mm -hmm. And I ask them very particular pertinent questions and the answers they give me, I look forward to uh, receiving. And um, I also get up and dance quite a lot. And then sometimes I interview from dancing and sometimes I am interviewed from dancing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, I don't know exactly who I'm going to interview this Saturday, but there is a wealth of interesting men and women that have touched me over the years. And the wonderful thing about interviewing them is that I find out more about them. And that interests me also, especially those of whom who are dead, um, because uh, I can interview them as if they're still alive and find out how they're doing and what, what, their, what their inspirations are. Um, I, I, I think in solo work, the beautiful thing about a solo is that the whole world is seen through the individual. 
there's only one on stage. And when the whole of the world is seen through an individual, it appeals to something individual in the watcher. And this is a particular state that any individual in the public has, is they're dealing with their perceptions of the world. And they know that those perceptions are different than their neighbors, but they're still dealing with their own perceptions. Mm -hmm. So to see anybody in a solo form touches that particular nerve. Mm -hmm. In a piece where there's a group of people, say eight or 12 or 15 or three or four, then they're dealing with the world and the perception of the world as a trio or as a duet or as a, you know, an octet. So the, the base of a solo is that you're speaking to the individual mm -hmm. and how the individual is perceiving and handling their life. Okay. And you said you are the only one on stage. Are there any other people behind the scenes, uh, maybe some people that you like to work with? When you work on the solo, I mean... There, I will, be, there will be somebody doing the lights. The lights? Yes. Okay. And that is a, a, a very wonderful duet because the creativity from the lights mm -hmm. uh, sees the piece from a completely different angle and therefore makes decisions in terms of lighting um, in a different way than I do from being on stage. And um, that gives the piece uh, a, a richness because you have mm -hmm. two points of view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But apart from the lighting guy and myself, no, it's just us two. Okay, okay. Um, okay, that was the, the performance uh, we are able to see. And let's go maybe uh, for the workshop because that's very interesting. And we have the participants of the workshop here. So um, maybe from your point of view, um, with what do you approach the workshop? Do you have anything in mind? Or maybe could you just first describe it? What's the typical day of the workshop? Or do you have any structure? Or you just approach it maybe without any preparation? Or just let yourself be surprised? The preparation is intense. And it's gone on for the last nearly 40 years. Um, and what that means is that there is ever more a delicate and fierce and demanding uh, specificity about the pedagogy. Mm -hmm. um, because the pedagogy, the subjects, all of the subjects that I teach come from the experience of making pieces and performing. That's where they come from and that's where they're aiming to. What the people do with the information, that's up to them. But they know that it comes from the performing world and it's arrow is aimed towards making performance. That's the, that's the through flow of the mind of it. But because after many years there's different sections, there's a section that deals with uh, time, uh, deals with uh, the space, deals with working with objects, deals with the voice, deals with word, deals with solo, deals with uh, group work. You can't cover all of that in, in one week without making it slightly supermarket alike or simply a taster for something else. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this particular, uh, the title of this week's workshop is called Making Dances and Poetic Richness. And again, it is exactly as described. Mm -hmm. It is about the act of making dances and uh, about the issue of what is, what is poetry, what is, what is a richness that we could call a poetic richness, and how can we actually work and allow that richness and that poesy to be in the dances we make. Maybe in general, can you say what, what do you learn when you teach the workshops, or what experience is it for you um, in person? I learn an immense amount. That's why I, I of course, I go to my workshops because I give my workshops, so I have to be there on that level. But one of the reasons I don't go to nearly anybody else's classes is because I just keep learning so much from the action myself. And uh, the sort of things that, learn, that I learn um, is certain areas of the work become clear. 
they become clear on an experiential level, but also sometimes on an intellectual level. And then sometimes that intellectual level will lead to another zone, which then becomes an experiential level. Um, sometimes I join up the dots, meaning that there'll be a zone that I've understood in another zone, and they've gone, ah, now I see how they fit together. Or there'll be something more of a perspective. I'll have a different perspective on this issue, this issue, with this issue. And I've already, already seen it like this, but I've never seen it from that angle. Mm -hmm. And all these different angles, are, they make, uh, they orchestrate the overall experience of the work. And they're always very fresh for me. And they're, they're revelatory in the sense that when, they, when, the, when that light goes on, it really is the, the first time, or it has the illusion of being the first time I've really ever realized that. Mm -hmm. This might be because I, I, I don't have the best of memories, so, so maybe it's just that I forgot it. But on the other level, that's part of the art of working, is that you, you work always, especially as you mature, not with a false naivety, but with an openness to hear it or see it or realize it for the, for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm lucky, that, that often happens to me. I will see something that will be a certain configuration of people or a certain way something is happening. And then I go, ah, now I understand how this bit fits into that bit of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that that could go on for another few decades. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you, could you imagine you would be um, only creating work and performing and you would not teach or um, is it, would, would you miss it or would you just, or is it the best for you if you do both? I mean the I pedagogical think, way I think it's that. a profession where, you know, like medicine and like a few other professions where they go together mm -hmm. wonderfully mm -hmm. because you know, performing, I love to perform and there's nothing like being the stage beast that you are and having that um, severity and frivolity that you can have on stage. And yeah, I wouldn't want that ever to be taken away. But there's a certain intimacy which happens when you teach, which is not just about that day, but it's also about the future. You're intimate with the future mm -hmm. because usually you teach people who, are especially for me now, who are younger than me. So you're talking to the future. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a great feeling. That's like passing the baton. Mm -hmm. And then you, then you go, wow, this thing's got a continuation. And you're, you're in touch, literally, you're in touch with the future. And I don't mean the future like some feared or overjoyed uh, moment, event. I'm talking about a whole lineage of time mm -hmm. because I'm very touched by my teachers and by the lineages that I come from. And part of the work is just to continue that lineage. And that's, that's a great, great privilege in teaching because you give credit to and you understand more and more. But in order to uh, be in your lineage, you are demanded to take it further. That's, that's just one of the deals. You've got to take it further. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not taking it further, you're regressing. There's no, you can't stand still in, the, in this work. Mm -hmm. And so the chance to have younger minds hungry and demanding and questioning, that helps pull, it for, pull the whole thing forwards. So that's, that's, the, that's the beauty of teaching. But um, I'm not planning to stop performing. Sure. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. That's, well, it's quite... Because the, there's, there's something that happens in performance, although I allow this to happen also in class, where you can go to a higher level of sense. You can go to another level and that's accepted. Mm -hmm or you can at least demand that it's accepted. Another, another, another layer beyond a certain quotidian normality. Mm. And I think that's just such a beautiful thing to share. I think we all hunger for it. Mm. And it comes from our daily life, but it also feeds back down into our daily life. 
So any chance that that stuff can be swinging, I'm a I'm, I'm happy man. Yes. Yeah. Very good to know. And then my question for you, Lee, I, 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 I have a question because uh, when you become a teacher, you know, like a name, and that's uh, like, how do you deal with dogma? With, how do you keep yourself open? You know, how, because even people put labels to people like, like gurus or like, you know, how do you work with this so that you keep yourself flexible and not to be influenced? Or, um, well, I usually go home and walk the dogs, and these last 20 years I've been looking after my boys, and, and I, I keep sure that the, 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 the house is, you know, not falling down and things like that. Uh, I, I don't usually go to those cocktail parties. I'm, I'm not very social like that. I never, I'm very shy. Um, and also, it's so rich to meet people in performance, and it's so very rich to meet them in uh, the context of teaching that those other areas, I, I, just, I just find myself somewhere else. I, I just, I, 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 don't, I don't find them a problem because I'm not there. Um, if at any moment on some level I've sensed those sorts of things. Two things. One, I ask people to, to, to just be sincere. So I will ask them if somebody, you know, if somebody says, oh, you know, oh, your work is like a guru or something like that, I'll say, no, what do you mean by guru? I want to know. You want to say something like that? I want to know. What do you mean by that? And very often it comes down very quickly to something that somebody really wants to share. And, but the opening door of it it has gone into this other level which is really not so important or interesting and is not, it doesn't do justice to me and it doesn't, more importantly, it doesn't do justice to the people who are saying it. So I just try to ask the very obvious question, you know, uh, just, yes, could you, could you say more about that or, and it just brings it down to something usually very, very concrete and heartfelt that people in the end want to say and the, and the only other thing I would say is, you know, it's the work, it's the work, it's the work. That's what's interesting. You know, I don't go there for the people. And in the end, they don't come there for me. They're there for the work. And this I was taught by, by some wonderful old dancers. Well, they were much older than me. They're, actually, they, they were then younger than I am now. But um, uh, they were, to me, really old, wise dancers at that point. And I remember uh, one of them saying, uh, Julian, don't worry about the students. You know, they're not there for you, they're there for the material. And you don't need to go there for them, you go there for the material. And that's where we meet. Valda Setterfield used to dance with Most Cunningham. She told me that very clearly. And I found that so simple and so generous, actually. Because then there's an openness that people can come for the material not for somebody or their personality or their whatever, and vice versa. Of course we like each other's personalities at times, or not. But that's not the main reason. That's what happens at moments. But the, the most important thing is, is the material. So as soon as I focus on the material, a lot of those things never rise up to even be issues. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not a profession where you can get away with being mean. No, 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 no. It, it is it's a generous profession. It's just the very idea that you throw your body about for years and years for hardly any cash. I mean, it, you know, I mean, it, it, you've got to be dedicated to something. But what I find beautiful about the, the dancers, they're incredibly generous. All over the world, they, you know, they'll come and I'll ask them to do this or this, and they're, they're ready to do it. You know, even, even more than some other groups of people, dancers are incredibly generous. They bring their bodies. If it wasn't for the generosity of the bodies and minds of dancers in the last 50 years, dance wouldn't have evolved how quickly it has done in the last 50 years. Yes, they've been great teachers, but great teachers are nothing without quality students. 
And quality means that they bring and they dare to experiment. They dare to follow. They dare to go to the edge of their understanding. And that, that is a, without that generosity, the whole machinery of, of the evolution of our, of our dance work and theater work, it just wouldn't have, it wouldn't have evolved at the speed it has. So, yeah, I think it's something deeply in the profession. And I find that very... It's held together by generous people, by people who'll have you staying on their floor. You know, as Michael Moore said, the whole thing is fragile. But it's through that fragility that actually it lives, and I think probably always did live. At least you go for it. <laughs> Yeah. Very interesting for me at the beginning. You said that, for example, here the financial situation works really well, and for you that's a sign that the creative part also is working well. And this is something that I'm very interested about, like how financial and art work together or don't work together. So it's a really big question for me. I didn't actually say financial. I said business. Business. At least if I if I I, I, I hope I said business. Well, we can check on the tape. What I mean by that is, uh, as my dear friend Bar Phillips says, you know, you've you got to keep your business together. You know, you've got you to you gotta do your business as an artist. And that doesn't mean to say that it's cool or only economic. That's to do with human relationships and when you turn up and when you answer your emails and all of those things. And that's, that's taking care of business. And I think that... Uh, there might be some romantic exceptions in the late 19th century in some very famous town or other where, you know, artists are eccentrics. But all the artists I know are incredibly well-ordered and well able to take care of business. They might have a little weakness here or there or the next place, yes. They're, they're, that's understandable. But... Um, no, in this profession especially, you've got to be able to take care of business. And I do think that when you do that, what you're actually celebrating is the, the sacredness, nearly, of the time that doing good business allows you to have. You know, this space we're in, this just didn't just happen. Somebody organized and allowed it to happen. That takes working, that takes uh, co-working, that takes colleagueship. That takes people with a vision. That takes turning up on time for the meeting and finding somebody to look after the kids. You know, that's, that's really what it comes down to. And I'm, I'm aware that all of my work, and that's why I love to go to the places that mostly I'm invited to, is because it's really heartfelt, that invitation. That's, that's, that's earned. They've earned their right to want to invite somebody. And I find that's a... That's, um, of course, that's, that, that develops a quality of person, you know. And uh, let's not romancify how artists are, that they're, you know, all over the place, or they're constantly drugged, or they can't... It's such a, you know, 19th century romanticism of the situation. Artists, especially dance artists, they have to keep their stuff together as well as the drugs, you know, as well as the out time, as well as, as well as going off into other worlds. But they also had to be back in time for the contract. And, and, I, and I, love that. I love that about dancers. They'll, they'll, they, they, they bring themselves and they look after themselves and they... Um, uh, all the dance that I started to do was organized by real intelligent women, to put it really bluntly. And without those ladies, and that's a continuing story, we wouldn't be here doing this. It's really, really, really simple as that. <laughs> no, no, when you look back at your career, do you see, like, do you think you made some mistake, or what was your first mistake? <laughs> that's that Iberic Peninsula coming out. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to you. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> what was my worst mistake? Gosh. What was my worst mistake? Well, there was that party in about 1987, which was, yeah, I really shouldn't have stayed so long. Or I should have stayed much longer. Um, um, 
I think it's not I would have I would have left home earlier and yet had I done that I wouldn't have studied English literature for three solid years and so I would have been lost without that poetry and literature or a bit a big bit of me wouldn't have been able to have um, the material to, to throb around um, but I, I was I was ready to get to get going straight away um, put it like this when I started I didn't lose a second of time you know um, what is strange about those so-called mistakes is that um, they do become less mistakes in the sense that you are f demanded to actually use their energy and at that moment of using their energy it's alchemy you change them from being a mistake you change them from being bad vibes into good vibes so it feels difficult to look back and say that was a mistake not simply because you protect yourself but literally because you've changed the past history or you've changed the influence of that past history as it's living now you know but in order to do that yes you probably have to go oh yeah 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 made a mistake there or I could have got out earlier or I should have left sooner or I, I shouldn't have been so shy at that moment I wanted to ask you because during the workshop you used a few times uh, word um, uh, pragmatic. Yes. And it's pretty funny because in context of art or doing art, dancing, theater, whatever, uh, it's not very usual to hear this word actually. But I feel it's an important word. So I just wanted to ask you if you can say something about it. Because uh, that's what, um, I mean, public may, might think that art is something which is flying somewhere in the air and it's crazy and artists are, you know, I don't know, uh, those crazy from 19th century and stuff. You know, so if you can say something about it. Okay, it. what we do on stage is not the same as what the people receive. That's the deal. And in order maybe for them to re receive the Empyrean Heights or the, you know, the, the, the Faustian depths uh, or to go way, way off on a universe, higher or lower, that that can only be received by them if we deal if we deal with the vegetables you know if we deal we've got to deal with real solid actual things if we get that right then what can come over is this beautiful privilege that the audience has to go beyond those things but I don't think it's for the people on stage to just immense, uh, uh, just wallow in the idea of going beyond, because you, they're never going to get beyond unless they're actually dealing with those practical things. I love these old blues songs that says, "Make it real, babe, one more time. Make it real, make it real." But us in the audience, we're as high as kites. We're getting, we're being taken to these wonderful different levels. But the guys on stage are counting if it's eight bars or nine, you know. And that's, that's, the, that's the beautiful deal about playing the music. You know, they're counting. Okay, maybe they count in this way or that way. But they're, they're, they're taking care of the, of the pragmatic, you know. And if you're, if, you're, if, you're dealing with, uh, if you're dealing with the stage and with space, you deal with every meter. You deal with uh, 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 one of the great dancers, Fred Astaire. You know, he divided up the stage into something like a hundred by a hundred tiny little squares and numbered them so he could turn and put the foot just on 58B. That's, that's dealing with it. what you see is this wonderful light and airy, did, did, did. that's practiced down to the millimeter, you know. And uh, if it's really practiced well, the people in the audience, they don't get the, 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 the weight or the, or the years or the hours of that, of that pragmatism. But body is pragmatic and have no fear about it because if you go deeply into the pragmatics, you get to the poetic. But you've got to go right into them. You've got to go deep, deep, deep into the, into the not just the pragmatic details, but how they are being. Because that's the wonderment. 
that's really the wonderment of... I don't know if you've ever seen Japanese wood joints. Oh, look at them, how the, how the Japanese make joints for wood. It's, I mean, you look at it and it's completely pragmatic, but it's totally poetic. It's just, you cannot imagine how they, how that happened. And I, um, I love making things just physically. I come from that tradition and I like to build things. And I feel that uh, when we make things in theatre, um, those details uh, are important. And when you get them right, then something can fly way beyond those details. If you don't pay enough attention to them, it doesn't work so well. And maybe another question, which is um, because you also use this word, you know, the, the word paradox. Yes. You know, that, that uh, you can feel like the, the basically probably the art, but probably life, like private life or any other life, I don't know, is full of paradoxes, right? And, and it's kind of like the main thing, maybe in the art, no? I don't know. Um, that I, it's constantly yes and, cons uh, and also no, like it's in computers, you know, oh, in, in the, no, in the quantum computer, you know, it works like that, that there is yes and no in the same time. Or okay, okay, in the, in, the, in the same time. I think you have to be very careful with both paradox and irony. They're, they're the, to, be, to be handled with, with uh, delicacy. You don't want to get too involved with those things in the wrong mood. Otherwise, they'll, um, they'll string you up, I think. They'll, 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 um, they'll tie you into a corner. Or they'll just throw you into some zone of cleverness to try and survive. What I mean is that when you go deeply into... Um, anything, you will find a layer or you will find a certain moment when the truths seem to flip. So, for instance, in, on the Earth's crust, every mountain range that goes up, of course, because it's a mountain, the crust gets deeper at that point. Um, The, 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 and there are many, many even, even scientific uh, moments when at, there's a certain point when you go in far enough or deep enough where the rules completely change, they flip. And that, that is this, that is wor this, wor uh, this uh, world of paradox. So, for instance, in the space work that we do, when you become really able to be physically what I call here, right on the ground and right in, deeply relaxed in the actual daily life of the place where you are, there's a certain moment when suddenly dreaming is deeply available, instantly. And you can actually dream about, or images from where you aren't suddenly come in to where you are. And th th these flips, Are the, are the paradox, they, are, they are the paradoxes. But you, I think you have to be very respectful of that. Otherwise, they become very dialectic. Is it this, is it that? And then you go ping pong, ping pong. And I think that's, that's, uh, I think that's a, a danger. But what's important is that if you go deep and you meet one of these moments where it flips, you have to be prepared to change rules completely because you're in a different state. And every state needs a different way of, a, of, of riding it. It's just like a horse. You know, when you're walking, you have to go like this. When you're trotting, you have to go up and down or just lean back. When you're cantering, you have to go like this. When you're galloping, you have to, you, you, you have to change state to go, to change your physiology to, to, to go into the different state. So when you, when you meet a paradox, you have to open something in your mind which is not just balancing around one, one perception of truth in one way. A question for this ideal space. So, then what we, we did it today, and I was thinking about the difference when we did it today with like the workshop. Yes. And what happened when it's not a workshop anymore, but it's a performance. Right. And then you have 
many people that in the audience. Yes. So that I, what I remember like in my experience, that this the feeling of radial space is different. Yes, indeed. In the workshop. Indeed. So how, how to work with this? The balance is the balance shift. And of course, this, depend on, this depends on which theatres you're in. Yeah. Because if you were in a theatre that was nearly in the round, or a semicircular, then of course what would, be, what would be developed or stimulated would be something where the radiality of space is more celebrated. Um, it also depends on the, whether the people are sitting down or standing up. Often when they're standing up, it's more radial because they're, they're just moving a bit. It depends whether they've got a drink in their hands or whether they're sitting around tables like in a jazz club. You play in a jazz club and it's a different atmosphere. So all of these things alter the balance. And part of the work is to, be, to notice those changes of balance and to be realistic that they're changing, but nevertheless to not let that disturb you um, with what it is you want to do. When I was in Dartington in England, there were great storms in the south of England over those years and there was a Japanese shakuhachi player which is a kind of flute that is very del delicate with the embouchure and whenever it was a windy night he would go out and play in the storm because the storm would just come in gusts but he wanted to have that challenge to play and to get through absolutely what, what he his intention with his embouchure and his way of playing, in spite of the different balance of air that was going on in a storm compared to a quiet musical um, uh, inside situation. So yeah, the balance changes. And then that challenge is how deep, how deeply you are familiar with what it is you want to do. So it's a, it's a great challenge. Um, and it's... Uh, one to prepare for, but it's a live beast each time. Yeah. So it means you doesn't change anything like in your way how you perform? Oh yeah, totally, it changes everything. But you change everything to remain the same. But in the same time you don't want to be changed because of the... No, I want to be changed. I like performing. That's why you perform, because you want to be in the live moment. And in the live moment, you're changed. It doesn't mean to say that you're dependent on the audience, no. It's just you're interested in change. It's like a sailor, you know. You want to go out and face the sea and the wind, how it is at that moment. Yeah. And then and if you're a performer, you just want to be in that environment. And because it's live, you have a chance to be absolutely realistic with that live moment. So of course you're altered. The question is, are you thrown overboard by it? Are you, are you lost? Do you lose all what it is you want to share? Do you, you lose your ability to hear and to perceive because those balances change? That's the, I think that's for me the critical question. If it's too many, if it goes too out of balance for what you can handle, then you're in panic and you're just surviving and that's, that's, um... But those moments are so, are so beautiful in performance. I, I did a, a show in Buenos Aires in a, in a huge theater there that they've just recently closed. And this was at the beginning of when people had mobile phones. And in one half of the audience, somebody had a mobile phone and the other half of the audience, somebody had a young kid. And at one point, the mobile phone went off. And another point, the kid went off. It was a revolution between the two sides of the theater, you know. And it was, so, it was so much fun because there was just this energy in the place. They were about, you know, they were, you can't, you can't, yeah, but you can't, but you can't. It was great, you know. And so I just, I loved that energy. I just whipped them up. I, 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 tried, I tried to get it to be, you know, a quick civil war before 10 o'clock at night. You know, it was great. It was, it was because there is just energy there. So it's always a case of if you can handle it, it can also be something which is like a light. It can shine more light on what you want to say rather than disturbing you from what it is you want to say.
Okay, well, I think we can just finish here. I think we heard some pretty interesting things. So thank you very much for You're very welcome. and for sharing some uh, nice thoughts. And